Hi, it's Dwyer, RichardDwyer.com. I'm an attorney in Northern California. Let's talk about a case that CBS News on its 48 Hours program has asked the public to help them solve. Right? It involves a murder that now has taken place nine and a half years ago. I would encourage everyone to Google the case. The victim's name is Kay Wenel, W-E-N-A-L, right? And you wanna Google 48 hours, they have an excellent page that talks about the case. Now, let's talk about it. I have some strong views here. I'm gonna disagree with some of the profilers featured on the CBS News 48 hour show. Let's briefly talk about the facts of the case. A 60 year old woman, and she's a former model, very good looking, is married to a 72 year old multimillionaire real estate developer. According to CBS, it appears that her husband was cooking the books in his business dealings and had been sued at least a handful of times by third parties. Now, this couple met while she was married to someone else. That former husband, a Vegas entrepreneur, was not happy that his wife had left him for another man. She also was married to other men when she was younger. The goodwill or bad will that existed at the time of those relationships is unclear. Now let's talk about the day of her murder. On May the 1st, 2008, the woman turns up dead in her house. Her throat has been slashed almost surgically by a sharp object that has never been recovered. On CBS's 48 Hours, numerous profilers who have looked at the case believe that immediately upon entry, the killer punched the victim in the face, knocking her eyeglasses across the room. She starts bleeding and backs away into the kitchen. The killer then follows her into the kitchen and slits her throat. The scene is bloody. According to CBSNews.com, all of the blood was the victim's blood. The killer left no fingerprints, no footprints, no defensive wounds, no hair or fibers. There are no signs of forced entry. But before the killer leaves, the killer does something significant. The killer, who presumably is wearing gloves, goes into the victim's bedroom and leaves a towel with smudges of her blood on it in her bedroom closet. It's only then that the victim leaves. Now, because of the nature of the injuries, some of the profilers on 48 Hours believe the killer was right-handed. Because of the force and ferocity of the attack, the profilers further believe that the killer was male. Now, here's where it gets interesting. A neighbor saw a man, one who had mysteriously appeared the day before on foot, walking through the neighborhood with a flyer about a house he was trying to sell on the other side of the development, right? The neighbor sees this same guy by the victim's house around the time that it is believed the victim was murdered. That neighbor helped police prepare a detailed sketch 
that shows a man wearing wired glasses with thinning hair and a friendly looking face. The neighbor is the only person to have seen this individual by the house around the time of the killing. And significantly, although the man claimed to live in the community, none of the neighbors who saw him with this flyer and who spoke with him, there's a verbal component, remember ever seeing him before. A short time after the murder, a letter was sent to a local paper. It's the kind of letter that you see in TV shows involving kidnapping, where the author cuts out letters from magazines and newspapers and pastes them together so that their handwriting or other personalized identifying markers will not be found in the letter. Now, preparation of such a letter, as you could imagine, takes a very long time and must be constructed one letter at a time, right? One letter of every word at a time. One of the profilers on the CBS 48 Hour Show contends that most of the authors of such letters are female. Now, the letter, curiously, was mailed 140 miles away from where the victim was murdered. It has no DNA or useful forensics. Whoever prepared the letter presumably wore gloves. The letter reads as follows. Let me pull up the page here. Give me one moment. I think it's important. Right? The letter reads as follows. It turns out she was just a money-grubbing blank. I loved her. She, we, could be together. She told me that she hated her house and that fat, miserable, lying, mother-blank husband. She said she loved me, but that was a lie. Two. I told her this would happen if she didn't keep her promises to me. Her blank family screwed everything up. Those white trash blank. His money was more important than our love. We could have been so happy together, but they blank everything up. Right now, that's the letter. Now, some of the profilers on CBS's 48 Hour Show believe that this letter indicates that a jilted lover from the victim's past was the murderer. They further point out that some of the victim's closest friends privately knew that the victim did not like the house that she shared with her husband. The letter refers to her dislike of the house. The argument is that the author of the letter must be authentic because they knew this private information. So on the 48 Hours show, they start exploring the possibility that the victim was having an affair. There's also talk about the men she was involved with in the past, including her upset ex-husband. They further note that her husband, who after her death offered a quarter of a million dollars in reward money for information leading to the arrest of whoever did this, was somewhere else at the time of her murder, as was her ex-husband, to whom she was married when she met her current husband. Now. Let me give you my view on all this. I'm going to beg to differ with the profilers who believe that this is a jilted lover. In my opinion, 
This was a professional hit made to look like something else. What I want you to do is to look carefully at the thumbnail for this video, which is the police sketch of the man seen at the house at the time of the murder. I want you to look at his glasses. I want you to look at his facial expression. I want you to look carefully at his hairstyle. In my opinion, that's a carefully put together costume. Someone who would pick those accountant looking glasses would not be reckless enough to first introduce themselves to the neighbors and then to be seen by the house in broad daylight before entering and murdering the victim in the middle of the day. That's risk-taking at a breathtaking level, the direct opposite of the accountant slash librarian image that the police sketch conveys. How is it that this man allegedly lives in the community, yet is not recognized by any of the neighbors to whom he shows the flyer? How is it that this man is so confident that he's on foot the day before, walking around where anyone can see his height and weight and where no one can see a color or make of his vehicle or a license plate of the vehicle he's driving. No, in my opinion, this guy is a pro operating in broad daylight. No one ever sees him buy a car. With his wired glasses and friendly disposition, he looks like a friendly neighbor by design, but he is not. No one has seen him since the day after the murder. I believe someone hired this man. He's clearly there to be seen and remembered so that the person who hired him can defend themselves at a possible trial by pointing out that they weren't him. That the real killer is this guy who not only talked with neighbors, but who made it memorable by having a flyer. Right? In my opinion, this professional does things by design. This is the guy who is just sloppy enough so that people remember him, but who is meticulous enough not to leave any forensic evidence. Let's look at the crime scene. Some of the profilers on CBS's 48 Hours believe that the crime scene shows a level of passion that's consistent with the killer being a former lover of the victim. I would argue that it shows just the opposite. First, let's discuss the entry. We're hearing that there are no signs of forced entry. Now, if this guy is a pro, as I suspect, he could easily have had a story to get the victim to open the door. Maybe something about selling his home. That's what the flyer's for, right? Information that he learned from the person who hired him, right? Knowing that the victim was unhappy with the home in which she was living. Once the victim opened the door, the killer could have had a gun to scare the victim before punching her, knocking her glasses across the room. Let's think this through. The victim starts bleeding, yet no one sees this killer or anyone else with any blood on them walking through the neighborhood. Now that's important because no one ever sees the guy in the police sketch in an automobile. 
I believe this guy is a professional to the point where he knew how to avoid having blood splatter spurt on him even as he takes out a knife and slits the victim's throat. I believe the towel with blood smudges left in the victim's bedroom closet was by design. Perhaps something suggested by the person who hired this killer. Perhaps that was this person's way of trying to make the victim look like a slut or the victim of a former lover. Now it's an important part of the crime and shows that the killer was not in a rush even though the killing takes place in the middle of the day. Now the letter seems to be some attempt to further the jilted lover narrative, but it just doesn't fit these facts. What jilted lover would show up and then try to meet the neighbors under the pretense of selling a house they didn't own? Isn't the fact that this killer actively sought out and talked with neighbors about selling a home consistent with the effort taken to hide their handwriting in the letter that they allegedly sent to the newspaper days after the murder? If you're going to show your face, your height, your weight, and your voice to several neighbors, why would you be concerned about showing your handwriting in the letter that you sent to the newspaper after the crime. In fact, why write the letter at all? Except to further some narrative about a jilted lover to throw the police off the scent. What jilted lover would be able to do this killing without a car? If you're filled with rage, are you really going to be able to walk around calmly talking to neighbors? Are you going to be careful enough not to be seen by a car where someone can make out the year and model of the vehicle you're driving? What jilted lover, presumably filled with emotion, would be able to slit the throat of someone without getting blood splatter on them, without leaving bloody footprints, without leaving any footprints. To sum up, in my opinion, this is a hired professional killer who stages the crime scene to look a certain way. After making sure the neighbors have seen just enough of him so that a good defense attorney can point to this unknown assailant as the, as the real killer at any trial involving their client. Now this has a profound meaning. The alibis of some of the people here, that I wasn't there at the time of the murder, doesn't remove their culpability. Because someone hired this hitman. Right? The person who hired the hitman wouldn't have to be at the scene to have orchestrated this hit. So, today, in my opinion, the hitman probably doesn't live in the state where this killing took place, Georgia, and probably looks very different out of costume. No glasses. Perhaps no thinning here. I don't believe police ever solved this crime. The victim's husband died years ago. There are too many ex-husbands. There are too many people who sued her husband. There are too many possible suspects. And the hitman hasn't been seen since. Right? This is a professional hit involving a very intriguing hitman. The kind who wanted you to see him with his glasses, looking friendly, talking about a house. The level of information that this hitman had 
was so advanced that they claimed that the only people he talked to about the house were people who had already been in the house. In other words, he knew who had been in that house, even though he didn't own the house. He didn't want someone saying, you're selling 123 Mayberry Street? Let me arrange to see the house tomorrow. He made sure that he only spoke to people who had already seen the house. Isn't it too coincidental that the victim wanted out of her house and that this hitman's cover story was that he had a house to sell? Right, so with much respect for 48 hours, with much respect for the team of profilers on 48 Hours who believe that this was a crime of passion, right? Let me just say, perhaps the person who hired the hitman had a lot of passion toward the victim. But this is a staged crime scene from someone wearing a costume. This is almost akin to reports of someone looking like Lee Harvey Oswald being at shooting ranges shortly before the Kennedy assassination. This person wanted to be seen, right? Look at the glasses, look at the conservative look, that's manufactured. If you look at the case this way, the police sketch is downright scary, right? The guy leaves the crime scene, no one sees anyone walking around with blood on them in the neighborhood and no one ever sees this guy get in a car i believe it's a professional hit let me hear from you i hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video thanks for stopping by